Well, all right. Let's see you. We dive back in with some leadership lessons from General Ulysses S. Grant. Last we left off on lesson 65, trust but verify. And now we move on to number 66, correct all mistakes. In the summer of 1884, Grant wrote a magazine article about the Battle of Shiloh. In that article, he criticized General Alexander McCook for his reluctance to pursue the retreating Confederates on the second day of the battle. On further reflection, Grant decided that McCook had been correct in believing that his troops were in no condition to go after their fleeing foe. I did General McCook injustice in my article. I am not willing to do anyone an injustice, and if convinced that I have done one, I am always willing to make the fullest admission. And here's your lesson. All misstatements, especially negative comments about someone's performance, need to be corrected immediately. Now, I did some reflection upon this particular lesson, and um, I could not really think of any examples that I had to uh, draw upon from my experience in the military. I'm sure there are some, but they just didn't really occur to me. However, they did come to, uh, I did come to some thoughts about my job at a little auto parts store by the name of AutoZone, um, <laughs> which I lovingly refer to as Zone. Uh, in any event, I was a part sales manager, and so a lot of responsibility fell on my shoulders in uh, times of great duress and stress, uh, uh, usually on the weekends, specifically during the lunch hour. Um, Sundays in particular were particularly troublesome. Um, you're just understaffed. I think you had yourself, one other person, uh, two other people. And in one such instance, there was a... Uh, female co-worker who took upon herself without being told to go into the back and start throwing oil, uh, which is something that uh, didn't need to be done, really, um, at least not at that point in time. But she took upon herself to go back there and do that. And the customers just started piling up and um, to the extent where we were just ta overtasked with, with people and um, yelling at someone across the store to come to the front or even stepping away. It was just wasn't something you could really do because there was just a line of people. Well, in any event, I had some family in town and uh, I needed to get out of there early. And so the uh, store manager inevitably came in around lunchtime and I had asked him, I says, hey, did you give so-and-so a standing order to say, go through oil if there was a lull in the, um, uh, in the day, say nobody was coming in at a certain point. So they go find something to keep themselves busy. And he said no, and he asked me why. He says, well, I need to go have a talk with so-and-so. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that you didn't tell them that they needed to go do that in case, you know, there's some standing order about it. He goes, no. And then he told me, he goes, you know, you're her boss. You can tell her. I says, no, 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 I got you. I just want to make sure I'm not stepping on my own feet and chewing someone's ass about something that they were told by someone else to go do because that in particular happened to me on more occasions than I would care to admit in the military, though I can't drill down on any specific reference. In any event, um, I went back before I went and clocked out. Matter of fact, I may have clocked out and done, uh, went back and I told her, hey, you know, um, who asked you to throw oil? And she says, nobody. I says, well, that's something that doesn't need to be done right now. There was a whole host of other things that you could have done that needed to get done that you could have done instead Instead, here I am, and here this person was, and we were just over, you know, inundated with customers, and you were in the back, not really doing anything that was necessary. And uh, probably in that around about that tone, not much more um, stern than that. And she proceeded to recognize that it was uh, a formal admonishment, so to speak, and uh, told me that I wasn't her boss. I started to walk away, and so I had to raise my voice, tell her stop, kind of amplify what was going on, and and tell her, yes, I am your boss. You know that, blah, blah, blah. She proceeded to get really snippy and blah, blah, blah. In any event, um, I kind of had to lock her down and got into a little bit of the sergeant mode, which most people aren't used to. Um, wasn't yelling, wasn't dropping any expletives, very cool and measured. But I did raise my voice a little bit in that way to uh, get her to know that I was being serious. 
any event, I walk, started walking, getting on my way out of the store, and the manager goes, so how did that go? And I go, eh, just was what it was. Did what I needed to do. He goes, okay. And so then I left. And I'd say not more than an hour, hour and a half later, I get a text to say, like, so-and-so's in the back crying because, you know, <laughs> you, you chewed her ass. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, that seems to me that because, you know, she's cute, she's never had to deal with somebody who would, you know, gave her a so a tongue lashing, quote unquote, a good ass chewing. Um, and that wasn't even, frankly, it wasn't even that big of a deal. Uh, but if someone hasn't experienced it before, it can be a little bit of a shock, I suppose. And um, in any event, correct the mistakes. And as the story went, um, it became kind of a scarlet letter on me for having kind of taken someone out to the woodshed. And even that same boss who I had it kind of, told I was going to go do that, correct the mistake, or then it wasn't even really a mistake. It was just, it was when she amplified the situation, telling me I wasn't her boss and that she was going to do what I was going to, she wasn't going to do what I told her to do. Then I had to put her in her place. And, um, before then it was just correcting a mistake, you know, not, not that big of a deal. Um, but at a certain point, there was one day when everybody's in the store putting things on the shelf, I hear the store manager in the back telling people doesn't know I'm on the other side of the oil rack he's like yeah what he did wasn't okay and I'm just like oh really now he's turncoating on me and you know I lost a lot of trust in that person because of that because of those comments and there was two other employees who were in the military and they're just laughing about it because they're like wow nobody can take a an ass chewing and all these other people start losing their minds over this over this kind of stuff that happened on a on a daily basis in the military and there was other employees who would stop talking to me because they uh, they thought I was a jerk at that point. Um, so the dynamic certainly changed uh, after I kind of dropped the hammer there, and just unreasonably so. But uh, I think you would hear people talking in the back in the back office about, oh, you know, he did this, he did that, he was so inappropriate, and then I would I would hear all this and I would raise my voice, and say, well, maybe if people did their jobs, but you know, I mean, I guess that's a little passive aggressive, but. Uh, so yeah correcting all mistakes uh, I don't know even if you do it in a diplomatic manner sometimes it rubs people the wrong way and maybe I'm not being completely honest with myself because memory is faulty maybe I was a little bit harsher than I recall but um, as it stands with my recollection it wasn't that big a deal until I had to put the person in their place about me being their boss which is just a childish kind of thing but in any event correct all mistakes Let's move on to leadership lesson number 67. And we start chapter six, don't scatter your resources. And first a little preamble. April 1862, January 1863. General Halleck, Grant's superior, assumes personal command of the army and takes two months to advance the 20 miles from Shiloh to Corinth, Mississippi. After occupying Corinth, Halleck disperses his forces. As a result, Grant, who replaces him as department commander, is forced on the defensive. Number 67. Respect the chain of command. On April 11, 1862, General Halleck arrived at Grant's headquarters and took command of the Army. Grant was second in command and also had nominal command of the right wing and the reserve. Orders were direct by Halleck to the right wing or reserve, ignoring me. And advances were made from one line of entrenchments to another without notifying me. When Grant became commanding general of all the Union, Union armies, he quickly came to the conclusion that he could not most effective, if he could not be most effective, rather, if he made his headquarters in the field with General George Meade's Army of the Potomac. But he resolved not to do to Meade what Halleck had done to him. I tried to make General Meade's position as nearly as possible what it would have been if I had been in Washington or any other place away from his command. I therefore gave all movements up for the Army of the Potomac to Meade to have them executed. To avoid this necessity of having to give orders direct, I established my headquarters near his, unless there were reasons for locating them elsewhere. 
This sometimes happened, and I had on occasions to give orders direct to the troops affected. And lesson. When giving direction, it is generally a bad idea to skip over the chain of command. Feel free to gather information from anyone in the organization, but don't tell someone who works for one of your subordinates what to do unless immediate action is required. If you make a practice of going around the people who report to you, you will undermine the authority and show that you lack confidence in their abilities, thereby making it impossible for them to do their jobs. And uh, many a times the chain of command in the military would be... Uh, I don't know, the, the totem by which you were, <laughs> you were forced to kind of praise, uh, for lack of a better uh, acronym or, or uh, metaphor, rather. Um, yeah, you just didn't do it, or else you uh, kind of reaped, reaped the wrath of those who you had skipped. Um, I gave it a think on this one to try and, uh, once again, try to, try to think of some example where I skipped the chain of command or saw someone who skipped the chain of command. And I gave a few stories where I had called in the company about my uh, end of service, uh, trying to get my terminal leave papers put in. So I don't want to drill back down on that. But um, one particular instance, which I will dive back and forth with one of the other leadership lessons, there was, again, another AutoZone story, but it also relates to kind of helping with your uh, peers, um, the people who you're in the trenches with. Um, there was... Uh, on a weekend, there's a point system. So if you're late or you just don't even show up for work, you get points. And if it's a weekend, you get double points. And if you reach a certain number of points, you are effectively terminated from the employment of the company. And uh, in this particular instance, uh, it had been a pretty pretty hairy time on account of we, we weren't fully staffed. And um, so everybody was kind of running around with their heads cut off pulling a lot of shifts and uh, in one instance one of the my co-workers fellow part service uh part sales manager he liked to ski and he hadn't got a chance to go up that season and so he asked me and the other parts uh, sales manager who would be pulling for him um taking his shift if he could go up that weekend as it was the last weekend of the season to go skiing and we were like yeah why not man uh, that's fine no problem right well apparently Somebody caught wind of that because our, our, the store manager was at a wedding of our previous store manager down in Arizona. And somehow the district uh, HR representative got wind of the fact that so-and-so was going to be taking the weekend off. Because I guess as a full-time employee, um, you're supposed to be available on the weekends or something like that. I was part-time doing full-time hours on account of... Being an actor, I wanted to have the uh, flexibility, if a job should come up, uh, to be able to take that and get off of work for it. But that stuff never materialized, so I was essentially a full-time employee without the uh, restrictions or uh, requirements to always be available or whatever. But here we were. We said we were going to take this guy's shift. She got wind of it, and she called the other guy that was kind of the acting store manager because I didn't want to do that, um, and she told him to put him on the schedule but not to tell him about it. So effectively, he would be, uh, what do you call it, not showing up to work, not showing up to a shift, a shift that he didn't even know about because she was trying to get him fired. And uh, I had heard tale of her doing similar uh, shenanigans. For what reason? I have no idea. Um, and I says, okay, good to go. Well, we're, we're telling Mike about it. Um, well, dropping names. We're telling the guy who it concerns about it because we're not going to let her drop the axe on him and take his job away because she's got some, you know, <laughs> some wild bend. And um, he was like, yeah, but we're not supposed to. I was like, you're going to let her run things? She's not down here man in the till and slinging parts with us, you know. I've got no um, allegiance to this woman who's trying to run things from, you know, a different state. So And uh, knowing how she's a total uh, – turncoat on everyone else too i don't know people in a corporate office versus people who were in the brick and mortar stores on the front lines i don't know there's a big disconnect so um i was like no i got this let it so uh i went home that weekend and i started going through uh what do you call it there's like a digital rolodex i can't remember the website but essentially they pay people for business cards and so you might go to some corporate dinner and you meet a bunch of uh 
top brass for all these different companies. You get as many business cards as you can. You go to this website, you upload them, and they will put all those names in their little registry, and they'll pay the people, I assume, that put the business cards up. So I went on there, and they had uh, like three free contacts that you could you could get. And so I, I picked the highest brass I could find on the AutoZone side of things that were listed on this website. And one was the vice president of HR, and I think the other one was maybe the president of HR. And that was, that was all I could uh, use. So I typed up this email, kind of let them know everything that was going on and um, what I thought about it. I started uh, dropping a lot of, I was in the military, if we'd ever done something like this on the front lines, you know, you, you, know, you got to have someone's back, blah, blah, blah. Put a lot of, um, I don't know, meat and potatoes into it. Um, and I also dropped in there. It sounds like something that somebody could be sued over, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that particular company had been in hot water for all sort of lit litigious type stuff. Um, so I'm sure that's the last thing they wanted. In any event, I, sh I fired that off to those two uh, email addresses because why not? What are they going to do? Fire me? Take away my $12 an hour job over me trying to come go to bat for someone else who's being... Uh, uh, assuaged you know or they're trying to fire them I was like do it you know it's just going to force me to find a better job because I was being lazy about my employment at the time so um they did that showed up the next day showed the other guy the letter and he was well, we gotta we gotta call the um we gotta call the head of HR the guy that's above her I don't know because we had uh, I forgot this we'd actually called that guy to try and go above her tell him what was going on and we got his secretary and we told her, uh, she goes, what's this in, what's this pertain to? Says, it doesn't matter. It's, we need to talk to so-and-so. Why well, I can't let you do that without knowing what it's about. I go, I don't need to tell you what it's about. And then I kind of lied a little bit. And I said, uh, our store manager told us to call and talk to him. And then um, that didn't work. So she hung up. And then, <laughs> that, oh, man, I'm just remembering all this stuff. Give it like a five-minute count. And our district manager was on the phone. Uh, actually, he was dry. He was on the phone. He's like, "I'm coming down there. Uh, what's going on?" Go, nothing. Don't worry about it, because they want to drag him into it too, because it had nothing to do with him. And um, I give it like 20 minutes, and he had just beat feet across town to get to uh, that store. And it was, he must have hit all the traffic lights, because I'm telling you, that's not a 20 minute drive. <laughs> An event. He shows up and he's like, what's going on here and blah, blah, blah. And so I, he was also a Marine. I stepped out in the parking lot with him and he goes, what's going on? I got, I got a call from so-and-so who says you're trying to talk to so-and-so and, -so and the, you know, the corp, the HR, the district HR head. I go, listen, this isn't about you. So-and-so's up to some shenanigans. And the first thing he said was, no, she's not, she's not doing anything wrong. And I go, you don't even know what it's about. And you're, and you're taking her side. What's going on, man? Let's you and me here. Let's talk you know, brass tacks. You don't know what she's up to. I was like, listen, I take it from me. I'm just trying to keep you out of it. It's uh, there's nothing. I haven't written anything about you, said anything about you. It's about so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, I go, okay. <laughs> and I let that ride. And it was like a four day weekend too. So I was just like at my wits end going, Oh my God, did that, that email even get through? Well, apparently it did. And, um, so the corporate, or not the corporate, the district HR guy calls the store up on like a Tuesday and they, they wanted me to talk to him in the back. And I go, oh, they want to talk to me? Why would this be? And everybody's kind of just smirking because they know. And so I go back and I'm, uh, hey, how are you doing? Uh, hey, so uh, I just, I'm curious why you didn't think you could call me and talk to me about this particular issue. And I go, oh, that's so funny because I actually tried to. Because the other guy was into me, like, hey, we got to at least let this guy know. And I was like, no, we don't. Just let, let the chips fall where they may. But he, he kind of wore me down. I go, okay, fine, we'll do it. And then the secretary got in the way. And I told him, your secretary, so-and-so. I just dropped, I dropped dimes on her. I was like, she told me I couldn't talk to you. She wanted to know what it was all about. I was like, so I didn't, I didn't press the matter. I just so, and he goes, well, things are being handled up here. And I go, I hope they are. Because that was some ridiculousness. Here's the unfortunate part. The person I went to bat for, the next day they were scheduled to work, they actually didn't show up. And so 
everything I did went to bat for this guy. He basically just proved this woman uh, to be, to have, a, I mean, her shit wasn't justified, but he certainly gave her more ammunition. But in any event, I kind of got ahead of myself telling that whole story, but I didn't quite know how to tell that story. And how will, why do I say that? Because the next leadership lesson, number 68, write personal notes. When, on April 25th, General Charles F. Smith died from an infected leg injury, Grant wrote to his wife, It was my fortune to have gone through West Point with the generals and to have served with him in all his battles in Mexico. And in this rebellion, I can bear honest testimony to his great worth as a soldier and a friend. Where an entire nation condoles with you in your bereavement, No one can do so with more heartfelt grief than myself. And the lesson, there is no excuse for not writing a personal note, whether it be of condolence or congratulations. Greeting cards are used by lazy modern-day managers who neither know nor care about their people. It's writing personal notes. So me jumping the chain with a letter that probably took me about three hours to go through and put together um i don't know i'd like to think it had some weight to it because i I went to bath with this guy um regardless of where the chips might have fallen or if that guy proved that woman correct you know i just it was the right thing for me i felt it was the right thing to do at the time because they were trying to get him axed but uh yeah personal letters they are important um and uh, I had some other examples here. Let me refer to my notes here. Letters of appreciation. Now, in the military, there is what we like to refer to as wallpaper. Now, instead of giving uh, a Marine a, or a soldier, a troop, a, a medal for something they may have done because they didn't feel it was, I don't know, uh, quite to, the, to the, uh, the scale of meriting such a thing, they'll write up a letter of appreciation, which I think is kind of bottom tier. And then there's like a certificate of commendation, um, meritorious uh, mast, I think. There's just, there's a couple different kinds of papers. I think I got a certificate of commendation for having gone to Iraq during the OIF2. And meritorious mast sounds right, but it also sounds wrong. I'm not quite sure if that's one. But in any event, there was one instance where we had these extended boom forklifts um, called the Skytrack. And it was like the newest piece of gear at the time. And uh, the inside of it was actually kind of like a, a new car, in a, in a manner of speaking. It had all these hard plastic, uh, form-fitted, very aerodynamic like interiors. They even had air conditioning. The only piece of gear that had air conditioning. Um, so it, it really didn't feel like a, a military piece of equipment in comparison to everything else we had. And I operated the hell out of that thing. Uh, but in any event, they came to uh, came to me one day, and we were in Tornam Palms in the Mojave Desert, and they, they told me that they were going to have a project for me where I'd just be driving the Skytrack around, but it was a specialized Skytrack, because what they had noticed, apparently, was that these things were overheating to some extent. And so they had taken it back to the company, and they basically retrofit it with a, a brand new cooling system, a new uh, radiator and such, and um, so they needed someone to drive it around and try to get the thing to to overheat and kind of run it through its paces and see if it worked or not and so I spent the day driving it around the thing only topped out at like 20 miles per hour with tailwind so driving back and forth uh, all day on the main road it was I don't know six seven miles I mean you'd start falling asleep it was so boring and tedious but um, it was a nice change of pace aside from actually doing uh, your typical material handling but in any event, I did that whole project. I got to meet some other uh, folks who had been in the military but were now in the private sector and made a few contacts. But then um, that was it. Uh, well, then when problematic sergeant we had as a platoon sergeant ended up leaving, uh, it was kind of fell to me to go through uh, his filing cabinet and clean it out. And uh, there I found a bunch of stuff he was kind of keeping for himself, including, but not limited to, a letter of appreciation from this particular individual who worked for the company who wanted to commend me for the work I had done in helping test out this Skytrack. 
Now, for whatever reason, I don't have any idea why, he never put that draft or that letter of appreciation that this gentleman wrote in front of somebody who would basically sign off on it to make it official, say you could disseminate this to so-and-so. I'm just assuming that sergeant didn't think that the things I had done really merited as much, even though all it really does is look good in your record. And why not throw that in a young Marine's record? Not going to hurt anything. This guy did a lot of crazy stuff, but, uh, you know, it's just like <laughs> you go to all that effort, you get a little bit of a pat on the back, and there's somebody who's going to throw a wrench in it. You know, it might not have amounted to much, but it does feel good to be recognized for what you're doing. So, again, personal notes. Um, what else do I got here? I also worked for a, another parts company that did a lot of catalog sales. And um, in a lot of cases, we get these letters from prison inmates uh, about wanting to get a catalog. And in a lot of cases, uh, we would just fill out the uh, generated form, have a catalog sent out to them. Um, ironically enough, those things would usually be considered contraband, as it was told to me, because they had uh, shift knobs with the nude female form, the likeness of a f uh, nude female form, and that would be considered contraband in the prisons. So those inmates generally didn't even get one. But in one particular case, there was a woman who sent a request, not for a catalog. She wanted to get a pen pal, and uh, somehow she had a catalog in prison, a female's prison surprisingly enough so i guess it's not contraband there uh, but in any event uh there was so much nonsense going on at that particular store that uh somebody with uh, the gentleman that showed me he was like this is crazy look at this this woman wants a pen pal and i was like all right her why not he goes really i says yeah what else am i doing you got us cold calling people you know i can do that in between all of that so i just wrote in this very disconnected way dropping a lot of jokes and this and that, and I, had, I formed a little pen pal friendship with this uh, woman in uh, prison. Personal letters. I don't know what that really has to do uh, with anything, but uh, it kind of stood as a basis for a, a pistolary novel that I started writing, uh, which takes the form of a bunch of written letters between myself, that, that prison, that woman in prison, and another person that shares my name. So, uh, anyway, personal letters. Let's move on, shall we? Know when to heed your subordinates. General Halleck began a slow, ponderous movement against Corinth, Mississippi, 20 miles away. During the advance, Grant made a suggestion to him regarding the Army's route of march. I was silent so quickly that it felt that possibly I had suggested an unmilitary movement. Four months later, in September 1862, while making preparations to attack Confederate General Sterling Price's forces at Iuka, Mississippi, General William Rosecrans made a suggestion, and Grant, unlike Halleck, listened to his subordinate. General Rosecrans had previously had his headquarters in Iuka, where there had been a most excellent map prepared showing all the roads and streams in the surrounding country. He was also personally familiar with the ground, so that I deferred very much to him in my plans. And the lesson. Don't ever reject a subordinate's suggestions out of hand. And always make an extra effort to be open-minded when your subordinate is closer to the details than you are. That's correct. Heed your subordinates. You know, as many times that uh, the boots on the ground who was doing all the stuff, they knew what was going on. And then the person would come in without even looking or seeing what was going on, just kind of assuming what they were doing, and uh, start making decisions. Or, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And it's kind of like, well, if you weren't here when this was going down, that was going down. Why are you, why, why are you trying to judge what, what decisions were made and this and that? But they also didn't want to hear it. I don't know if it's just out of hand or to some extent they want to look like they know everything and uh, – if they were to listen to some lowly lance corporal, them being a staff NCO or higher, or even a sergeant for that matter, and I don't know, they look like they lose a little bit of power, a little bit of status somehow, or they lower themselves to some extent. You know, as in, uh, in AutoZone, I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about vehicles, um, just a little bit, so I had to err to, this, to the people that were beneath me. Hey, you know, so-and-so's got a whatever year car, this is the problem he's facing, what do you think it might be? There were some people in the store that'd be like, "Ah, oh, you you need to figure this stuff out yourself." And it's like, "Well, 
come on now. I don't want to set up the customer with the wrong information, have him buying stuff he doesn't need to buy or, you know, installing things he doesn't need to install based on, on my ignorance. So let's get together and collaborate for the, the good of the person who's, who's in here. Because we, we, we want them back, but we don't want them back. You know, we want them back for the right reasons, not because we screwed up, not because I screwed up. And so we got to do the right thing. He, even if it's asking someone who's quote unquote beneath you, if they know the information. Um, let's see. Uh, this also leads me to another story, a little prolonged here. So back when I was in high school, thereabouts, <laughs> no, it was exactly in high school. We had a little class called the SIM class, a certificate of initial mastery. Don't believe it's around anymore. But they were touting it as the next big thing. And uh, all of the students saw right through. I don't know if it's school we saw right through it or we just knew it was a pain in our ass. Nobody wanted to do it. You essentially would take all these examples of pieces of work from various classes if they stood out amongst your uh, au revoir, so to speak. And you would throw it in this folder. And then you would kind of check these boxes that met these requirements to show that, hey, this is your certificate. Uh, this, this will go towards your uh, evidence of, of mastery, I suppose. And so every couple of weeks, we'd have this extra class where we would go and sit down and um, rifle through this folder and try to f figure out what we wanted to submit to be an example to go towards this so-called mastery. Well, a lot of people started ditching that class because they didn't think it was worth anything, and rightfully so, because I do think they disbanded that whole thing and went after some other harebrained scheme, and I believe it was kind of a teach-the-test kind of situation, uh, inevitably, from what I read. Uh, but in any event, I knew my folks would come down on me hard if I, even if I ditched a class that wasn't a real class. So um, I was always one of the few people that was going to that stupid thing. And uh, at one point... I don't know what it was, but there's a general consensus that nobody was going to go to this class. And so I decided not to go. Um, <laughs> all we did was sit in the cafeteria, kind of had a, uh, an extended break, I guess you could call it. But I get home and sure enough, what's waiting for me? Uh, a message on the phone that I ditched this class. And my folks, well, my dad specifically, was not happy to hear as much. And uh, point being... He sat down and he talked to me and he asked why. And I says, everybody was ditching this class. And he goes, well, that's, you know, and nobody, you know, follow another person off a bridge, right? Well, so I go back to school the next day talking with all these people. I got detention, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's laughing. I'm the only one that got detention. So it seemed the fact that I always went to these classes, that it was essentially noticed that I didn't show up didn't necessarily help that the teacher I had for that particular circumstance was uh, a science teacher of mine. So it was obvious if I wasn't there, but uh, I got home that night and I says, Hey dad, like, uh, this is some garbage. Like I'm the only one that got attention. He goes, well, that's not possible. I says, well, <laughs> my whole cadre of friends, I'm the, all of us, all of us didn't go to that dumb thing. I'm the only one that got attention. And my dad was like, well, that's some garbage, isn't it? I says, yeah. Whatever. Went on with my day, my night. Got detention. Big deal. Hour, two hours out of my day. So what? Well, so I go I go back to school the next day, and I just so happen to be walking by the, the front office uh, where all the secretaries hang out. We take the phone calls and such. And there was just this huge stack of, like, pink. I mean, from what I recall, it was like that. It was just this huge pink stack of detention slips because I think the only thing the only thing that was pink was the detention slip. And then as the course of the day drew on, they started handing those out to everybody. And so we get to lunch, and uh, all my friends now have detention slips. I'm like, <laughs> I started laughing, and I told them, like, yeah, I told my dad about blah, blah, blah. And um, they go, well, you did what? And I says, yeah, I was the one that got detention. He goes, man, you're your dad must have called the school and caused a sting. And I go, I doubt it. That's exactly what he did. He called the school and he was like, you're not going to single out my son for something that everybody else was doing. And uh, <laughs> so I was in preparing this little story here. I went up to talk to my dad about it. And he bestowed upon me some other knowledge here. 
Um, cause I was telling him, I like appreciated that fact that he did that. It was comical and that it, it was nice to see that, you know, somebody would trust their kid and stand up for him because typical, uh, stereotype, I suppose, is that the, the parent's going to trust the teacher and the kid's going to say, I didn't do that, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, they're, they're lying. You're going to trust your kid over me. Well, my dad believed me. And, uh, he told me that he had a similar story when he was a kid. He was in choir, and I guess they went up to Canada to sing, and they were attached or um, not attached. They fell into the responsibility of somebody who was a local to drive them to and from different places, and uh, they were told under no certain circumstances do you leave this individual. Well, that individual drove them to a kegger, and they didn't know their way around town, so there's no way they could just like, and it's, bloody cold out apparently there's no way they can just go hitchhike or they don't even know where they live they were staying at so they had to stay at this kegger and just wait until this guy was ready to take off or whatever back in the you know the 70s so i'm supposing the dude was probably a little bit blasted when they drove back but here nor there they got back to school and they says uh, we know that a bunch of you went to a kegger and we know who it was so ri- be honest and raise your hands or this is gonna go badly for you so my dad and his friend raised their hands my dad's dad was a cop so he knew that this was going to go bad for him if he wasn't honest about it or it was going to go bad either way but it was going to go worse if he lied about it and the other guy's dad was a preacher um so my dad and that guy got suspended and everybody else got to walk and it was everybody else who was drinking uh so there's probably a lesson in there <laughs> don't believe a teacher when they say they know um but and here's the reason I say that they suspended him. And regardless of the fact that he said we weren't drinking, we had no way of getting back to where we were. You told us to stay with this guy. That's what we did. They didn't care. They still uh, they still leveled on him, you know, the power of God and, and fear and all that, despite all that. So I kind of took it in my mind that that little holdover of nonsense and the fact that uh, my dad's dad couldn't really do anything for him. Uh, and it kind of sounded like he didn't necessarily go to bat for him um, or just let it lie. Um, I don't know. Things were different back then. Maybe that's why. But uh, I think my dad was kind of like, that was bullshit. And I'm going to stand up for my kid because he knew. And, you know, the suspension went on his permanent record or whatever. And it's like, that shouldn't have had to happen. Um, but, yeah, I thought that was a nice little a nice little uh, antecedent to that particular story. Um, so, yeah, and I suppose... Well, with that, we'll move on to the next leadership lesson. Insufferable bosses. After the Confederates evacuated Corinth and the Union forces occupied the town in May 30th, 1862, General Halleck continued to give orders directly to Grant's subordinates. He so totally ignored Grant that Grant found himself in the embarrassing and, to him, unendurable position of being a commander, quote-unquote, with a nominal command and yet no command. I had repeatedly asked to be relieved from duty under Halleck, but all my applications were refused until the occupation of the town. I then obtained permission to leave the department, but General Sherman happened to call on me as I was about starting and urged me to strongly not think of going, that I concluded to remain. Halleck was appointed to command of all the Union armies with headquarters in Washington on July 11th. Quote, unquote, when General Halleck left to assume the duties of General-in-Chief, I remained in command of the District of West Tennessee. Practically, I became a department commander. So only a month after Sherman had talked him out of leaving the department, Grant had become its commander. And the lesson, the saying, in time this too shall pass, Holds true even if for insufferable bosses. Hang in there. Jumping ship too quickly could cause you to miss a golden opportunity. Insufferable bosses. Well, I have had my share of that very thing. How did I, what did I write here? I had my share. I just said that. Get a new job. That was my... <laughs> You go get you a new job. Well, if you're in the military, you don't really have a say in that. Uh, you can. I went and applied for uh, Marine uh, Security Guard 
essentially to get out of 29 Palms because after we got back from Iraq, we barely had any equipment in the lot and a lot of it was broken. So there wasn't really anything we could do. And so they just had us going on a ridge run and a ridge run. If you see pictures of 29 Palms over the main side, you'll see this mountain range kind of behind main side there. And essentially you would run those, those uh, sharp rocky cliffs and then um, a couple of the sand dunes in there and run in and around the back of it. I think it was about a five mile run. So they had us doing that sometimes twice a week um, just because they had nothing else for us to do. And uh, I was getting pretty sick of that garbage. So um, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to put in, I'm going to try to put in papers for this MSG thing. And I'll tell you what, it was, it was a heartache and a half because it was like, it was like nobody wanted you to leave. It's like they were kind of jealous, like, oh, this guy sees, this guy sees a potential way out and I'm stuck here. So I'm going to, I'm going to make it hard for him to, to, uh, to exit. And it sounds funny, but we had like a security sergeant because you had to go through and you had to fill out this, uh, I think they called it the SSID form. You basically had to do your whole history so that the, the FBI could come and interview people to see if you were uh, the kind of person that was going to turn code on the country. And, um, you know, the past 10 years of your life, maybe farther, uh, every place you lived, and then you had to have a reference that wasn't family who could prove that you lived there and, and so they could interview them. But unfortunately, you also had to put in, like, your boot camp address, uh, your MCT address, uh your MOS school address, and then you had to have a source for someone who knew you there. And it's like, I don't know any of that information. And they were like, all right, I guess, I guess we can't fill out this uh, SSID thing then. You need to have this stuff or we can't clear it. So by the grace of God, I, I was like, MCT was the hold up. I was able to reach out to MCT and get a hold. I was like, hey, this is a shot in the dark. But uh, I was back there in like 2002 like January and I know you're not gonna be able to find like somebody who's in charge of that platoon and I know they're not gonna remember me and uh, we were there a month and then uh, we had like 200 people in there and uh, they go you know what I think so and so is still around from there and they transferred me over there and I said the same thing that he goes dude I don't remember you and I says hey <laughs> you're preaching to the choir staff sorry but these guys got me bent over a barrel here I gotta fill this out and he goes ah just put my name down whatever you know um He's like, it's lucky you call when I did, because I'm out of here in a couple of weeks. Like, <laughs> like, I won't even be here. I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, so a little ridiculous to that extent. But the, I, I digress. This woman who was the security sergeant, she would not sign this thing. There's any kind of little discrepancy in that thing. She's like, I'm not signing it. Just an insufferable, not my boss, but an insufferable leader. And it just seemed like, ah, oh, we don't want this guy to leave. Like, if I can't leave, I don't want someone else to. And just the whole checking out process was um, unbearable. They gave me a little bit of leeway so that I could drive to main side and, and do the things of my own uh, prerogative. And they were very hesitant to do that because a lot of Marines would, would uh, you give them an inch, they'd take a mile. They'd be going off to eat lunch at this place or that place and taking their sweet time doing this, doing that. Well, not me. I was doing everything I could and just hitting roadblocks left and right. So finally, the gunny who kind of went to bat for me, who had been at MSG and wanted to see me go through and do it, he was like, what's the status on this thing? And I was like, they're, they're not helping me out. He goes, well, let me see your checklist. And he's looking at it. And I had maybe gotten two checks since the last time he looked at it. He goes, what have you been doing? You've been screwing around. I'm like, no, not at all. I, and here's listen to your subordinates. I said, I go to this place. They tell me no. I go to this place. They tell me no. I go to this place. They told me I need to have this, that, and the other thing. And he was like, He's like, oh, no, no, no. So he, he grabs a sergeant uh, who had been in the Gulf War who wasn't really doing anything. He was like, I want you to take that man over to main side and make sure he gets all this stuff done. He was like, really? You want me to hold this guy's hand? He goes, I want this done. And he was, he was livid, but he understood. And, well, he didn't understand at the time. I, I go, yeah, I'm, you know, so I'm sorry, sorry, White. I, you know, I've been trying to do this stuff, you know, honest, you know. Honest engine, but they, they just keep, he goes, uh-huh, let's, and so we show up that first place. Sure enough, I told this guy we're not going to do it because of this, that, and you know, I go, yeah, but look, this, that, he goes, mm. so he's getting, he starts getting hot. He goes, I don't understand why they're not signing this garbage. And I go, mm, I don't either. And we end up going to that security sergeant, and she once again, no, I can't do it. And so he's like, uh, he goes, sign it. And she goes, I can't because blah, blah, blah. And he goes, he points at me to turn around. And he puts his finger on the paper and he turns his head. 
and he waits and I just I see him looking at me and he just got his hand on his on his hip and he's just waiting and she finally just she finally just signed it and he's like all right let's get out of here and so that was it he had to hold my hand through like three quarters of that process memory serves just because nobody wanted to let me go but he heeded the subordinate I told him what was going on and uh they saw that it was some bullshit and they helped me out there um so my heartfelt thanks to, to Gunner Sergeant Washington and Sergeant White there. I know that's not their ranks anymore, if they're even in the military anymore, but that's what they were to me at the time. Uh, and I know that's totally off subject. Uh, insufferable bosses. What else do I've got? What else do I've got? Oh, yes. This one was a little bit special here. There was a lot of people who I did not have any respect for um not not only just people above me but pe my peers my comrades and so when i was leaving to actually go out to msg uh school i they wanted me to give a little speech they had gotten me a plaque and they says all right get out in front of the platoon and give a speech i'm like oh, i don't say but i got out there and i'm looking at everybody those i respect those i don't and i Cut to the quick, I basically says, I will remember you all. You all have taught me something valuable. What I didn't say was in a lot of cases, they taught me how not to be. So um, that was important. You know, I think some of those people who have a big ego, they're like, oh, he actually learned something from me. Yeah, I learned how not to be. So with that, I'm going to close out for cigars, whiskey, and winning leadership lessons from General Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, I got a link for this down in the description, a little affiliate link. If you want to get a copy of your own, follow along, or just read yourself, uh, I encourage you to do so. It's a good little read. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Uh, let me know down in the comments what you thought. You like, dislike, whatever. We'll have a, we'll have a little bit of a correspondence there. Personal letters, if you will. So uh, anyway, thanks. I hope you enjoyed yourselves and got something out of this. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you on the next one.